está ya, ¿no? Ya está grabando. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning. Esto. I think uh, we can start. Uh, today, uh, this is a new colloquium in the Instituto de Física de Andalucía. And today we have the talk by Dr. Nuria Miret Roy. Uh, she will talk about the rich population of free floating planets in Upper Scorpius. Uh, Nuria will be introduced by uh, our uh, PI, um, Isabel Vargas. Isabel, please. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here again in this new uh, Severo uh, Ochoa web colloquium, web locum, I mean, hybrid uh, uh, format now. It's a pleasure for us to have uh, with us Nuria Miretroy. Um, uh, she did her undergraduate studies at the University of Barcelona, where she, she had her first uh, experience as a researcher with the Gaia team. Then she moved to Bordeaux in France to purchase a PhD uh, that was entitled Cosmic Dance, which is nice, a comprehensive census of nearby star forming regions under the, supervisions, uh, uh, the supervision of uh, Professor Hervé Bouy. Uh, this work uh, focused on the low mass end of the initial mass function is particularly is um, particular fleet protein planets, excuse me, has been awarded with the 2022 Merak Prize from the best PhD thesis in the category of uh, observational astronomy and has also deserved the Science and Technology Thesis Prize from the University of Bordeaux. Uh, Nuria Miret uh, is author of uh, about 35 papers in uh, peer reviewed uh, publications. And currently, she's a postdoc at the University of Vienna. She was, uh, she was a tutor uh, at our Severo Troa Advanced School uh, on Star Formation last autumn. Uh, Nuria, thank you very much for accepting our invitation uh, that I, I take the honor to, to uh, extend to, um, to the next uh, meeting that we will have in October, if you, if you will be able to, to come here again. It's a pleasure to, to, to have uh, you with us in person, and uh, it's an opportunity as well for our, our young researchers, especially to, to be, I mean, to, to be with you and to talk with you, to interact with you in person as we were expecting uh, all of us. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me to be here in, in Granada. It is a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to be here uh, in person. And I hope that afterwards we can have a, a discussion on all the work that I will present today. So indeed, uh, my, my idea today is to present the most important result of my PhD. Uh, which we recently managed to publish in the review Nature Astronomy, which is related to um, the discovery of a rich population of free floating planets in the region of, of Upper Scorpius, and which has been possible thanks to uh, the collaboration in which my PhD took place. And I would like to acknowledge uh, now all my, my collaborators. Um, oh, okay. So I would like to start this presentation by uh, mentioning the key ideas I will uh, discuss today and I will present today. So first of all, I will present the discovery of a rich population of free floating planets. I will exp explain you the research that we uh, did that led to, to this discovery. Then I will explain how the mass function can help us to understand better the, the star formation theories and can help us observationally to constrain these theories. And finally, I will talk about the importance of uh, precise stellar ages. Okay, first of all, so my goal is to understand how do stars form. And uh, here I show you an image of the region of Ophiuchus where star formation is uh, presently ongoing. Uh, stars form in the densest clouds um, 
when basically a clump of gas becomes gravitationally unstable and begins to collapse under its own gravity. Uh, in this scenario, stars also form at the same time as planets, and planets are the lightest products of star formation. They are uh, th thus highly sensitive to dynamical interactions, and for this reason, they give us also precious information regarding the initial conditions in which star formation takes place. For instance, they can give us a lot of information uh, on uh, stellar feedback. And um, so while star formation process is currently more or less well understood, there are still a few uh, um, physical processes to, to be settled, like the exact uh, role of magnetic fields, or feedback, or or turbulence, but I would say that the overall picture is, is well understood. When we move to uh, substellar objects, it, this is still a highly debated topic. And the reason is that several mechanisms have been pre proposed to explain the formation of such substellar objects. For instance, it has been proposed that um, brown dwarf and free floating planets could form similar to low mass stars by the co contraction and collapse of small clumps of gas. It has also been proposed that uh, brown dwarfs and free floating planets could form in uh, the circumstellar disk around a star. And finally, due to uh, dynamical instabilities, be ejected from the uh, parent system. Also, we can think of a scenario in which several cores are accreting material from the same gas reservoir, and then dynamical interactions between these cores can end up with the ejection of one of the cores, which eventually will not have enough mass to become a star. And finally, also at the vicinity of very hot, massive um, stars, the strong winds of these OV stars can evaporate the envelope around a, a small core, and eventually this small core will not be able to accrete enough mass to become a star. So while all these uh, mechanisms have been proposed, and in fact, they have been proved to be able to form substellar objects, now the, the key question is, which is the mechanism that dominates and whether this is a universal uh, answer or different regions, in fact, in, in different regions with different conditions, different mechanisms can take uh, different important roles. And to try to answer these questions, uh, now I will try to convince you that the mass function is a, an important um, parameter that can help us to tackle this, this question. So here you are seeing uh, different objects from the most massive OV stars towards uh, low, lower mass objects, the sun for reference. And when we go to um, lower mass objects, we find the brown dwarf regime, and finally the planetary re regime, when, to which I will be referring as free floating planets. Those are planetary mass objects, which are not bound to a more massive star, but uh, on the other hand, they are just roaming freely on the galaxy. And so we have these different types of objects, and eventually the initial mass function tells us which is the exact proportion among different types of objects. For instance, it is well known that very high mass stars are very rare. On the contrary, low mass stars are very frequent. But currently, it is uh, still very complicated uh, from the observational point of view to precisely measure the amount of brown dwarf and free floating planets that form after a, a stellar burst. And the reason is that those are the faintest objects and the most challenging ones to detect. So as I was mentioning, now it is relatively simple to study the stellar mass content of the, of the initial mass function. Especially now with Gaia, it is relatively simple to identify groups of stars which were formed together in the same star burst, thanks to the extremely good precisions uh, in the astrometry of Gaia. However, if we want to study the low mass uh, end of the IMS and, and the substellar content, um, most of these objects still escape from the Gaia detection limit, and we need ground-based images to, to identify the, those objects. This becomes especially true in 
star forming regions where the stars and planets are still embedded in the parent molecular cloud and where the levels of extinction are very high. And then we need not only images in the optical where Gaia operates, but it's also very important to have images in the infrared where we can see through the extinction and through the dust. And this is exactly the idea of uh, the Cosmic Dense project. This is an ERC project from Herbe Bui, my PhD advisor. And this was also the idea of my PhD. So basically, we, pro we did our own observations to provide catalogs of nearby star forming regions. Then we use uh, statistical tools to try to identify the few hundreds of members of these uh, star forming regions from the vast amount of millions of background source, uh, sources, like um, far, uh, far away stars and galaxies. And finally, with this uh, comprehensive list of members, we can eventually study the process of star formation and stellar evolution. Uh, with this slide, I want to illustrate uh, what I was mentioning. So this importance of having these ground-based images. Here you are seeing uh, uh, some of these uh, dense images that we obtained from the ground in a high extinction area and in a low uh, extinction area. And these yellow circles correspond to the Gaia detections. So it is uh, very noticeable in both cases that um, Gaia misses many of the sources that we can detect in our images, and those are crucial to identify the, the lightest objects members of this region. And in this sense, um, the, uh, there is a new survey coming. This is the, the Visions survey led by, by Stefan Mengast and Joao Alves at the University of Vienna. And it is a survey with the Vista telescope at ISO that aims to catalog the, the star forming regions observable from the Southern Hemisphere. After this uh, brief introduction, now I would like to present you the, the area where I did my PhD and where I searched for these uh, free floating planets. So in this image, you are seeing an area of 170 degrees squared in the sky, which encompasses uh, at here the area of Upper Scorpius, which is an uh, OB association which has between five and 10 million years and is part of the Scorpius and Taurus complex. And then uh, also here um, you can see the clouds in Ophiuchus, which are younger, only they only have between one and three million years. Star formation is still ongoing in the region of Ophiuchus. Um, but it has the complexity that this paramolecular cloud uh, difficult a lot the identification of, of young stars uh, in comparison with upper Scorpius, where the paramolecular cloud has already vanished, leading to relatively low degrees of extinction. Then what uh, we did, first of all, is try to map this, this whole area. And for that, we did, uh, we carried our own observations, and this gave me the great opportunity of visiting some of the largest telescopes on Earth. This was certainly one of the best parts of my PhD, having the opportunity to visit all these telescopes. And we combined our own images with uh, all images public in, in public archives. And with this um, procedure, we were able to collect around 75,000 images, which were taken uh, over the past 20 years. And this time gap is very important because, as I will mention afterwards, we will try to compute uh, proper motions. And the, the larger is the time span, the more precise the proper motions will be. Then uh, it's also maybe worth not uh, mentioning that these images come from 18 different instruments. This certainly introduces a lot of complexity in the, in the data reduction and analysis, but this is, this is the only way of having the large data set that, that we had and which finally allowed us to detect the faintest objects in our images. 
And also another number I found uh, impressive for reference is the number of individual source detection in the images, which you can see is similar to the uh, final size of the Gaia catalog. And also, um, so this was possible, as I mentioned, by making use of all the observatories available on Earth and thanks to the large uh, collaboration with scientists from uh, many different institutes. Then with these uh, images that we reduced and analyzed, we built the what we call the dance catalog, which contains finally positions, proper motions, and multiband photometry, both in the optical and the infrared. And we, our final catalog contains 26 million sources. We combine this uh, dense catalog with the Gaia catalog in the same region. And the Gaia has, has the advantage that has um, a more precise astrometric solution. Also, it has the great advantage of having the, the parallaxes on top of the proper motions, but it only has um, optical photometry and doesn't have um, photometry in the infrared. Finally, we also considered uh, the, the Iparcos catalog. And, but this was just to have uh, the most complete uh, census possible and to include the giant stars in this uh, star forming region. And for instance, uh, the giant star Antares, it's, it's too bright to be observed with Gaia, it saturates. So to have uh, a final complete catalog, we also included the Parcos. But uh, it's important to say that the bulk of the analysis was done with, with Gaia and Dense. And then here you are also seeing a diagram or where uh, it shows the precision in proper motions as a function of the magnitude. And what is clear here is that for bright stars, Gaia has the best precision possible. And we use uh, Gaia proper motions whenever they are available. Here, the advantage of dance is that it still can provide us proper motions six magnitudes deeper than Gaia with relatively good precisions. And all these sources will be fundamental to um, finally identify the substellar objects in these regions. So this is where the power of this uh, ground-based effort is. is um, And now uh, what you are seeing is one of these images that we reduced as part of the dance project. And where you can see, um, well, this is one of many images in the region of, of Upper Scorpius. You see many stars and galaxies. And now I, I have a question for you. And maybe one of you can um, dare to, to say what you see at the center of this image. Don't know if you have any ideas or, well, otherwise, um, what you should be seeing is this tiny little red dot at the center of the image. This is one of the free floating planets that we managed to identify. And to me, so it is impressive, not only that we have the capabilities to, to detect this, this tiny little red dot, but also we are able to measure its proper motions with a precision uh, sufficient enough to classify this object as moving with the rest of stars in this, in this complex. Now I will try to briefly explain uh, the membership analysis. So how did we manage to detect and classify this object as part of uh, Upper Scorpius? And basically our membership algorithm is an expectation maximization tool, which classifies independently the, the field and the cluster population. And this, this uh, algorithm was developed by, by Luis Mazarro and Javier Olivares. And basically it models the, the field population with a Gaussian mixture model, both in astrometry and photometry. And the cluster population is modeled with a Gaussian mixture model in astrometry, as you can see here, plus a principal curve in different color magnitude diagrams. Then you need a, an initial list of, of members of the cluster you want to uh, 
to study. But this initial list can be slightly contaminated and it can be incomplete. It is just to find the locus of the cluster in the parameter space that, that we want to use. Then um, this model works iteratively. First, you compute the cluster model. You compute membership probabilities for all the sources in your catalog, and you classify them uh, between cluster and, and field members. And finally, once you have the new uh, cluster list, uh, cluster list, uh, you can update the cluster model and, and continue this process until the, until the algorithm converges. This, this uh, approach has the great advantage that it allows us to combine into the same analysis all the information that we have. That's to say we can put into the, the same box all the astrometry and photometry information. We can also account for the uncertainties in these observables. And finally, we can also take into account um, sources which have complete information. That's to say, sources which may have uh, optical photometry, but not photometry in the infrared or the other way around. Then what we did is apply this membership algorithm to the catalogs I have just presented. And uh, finally, we found uh, 3,500 members of this uh, big uh, region, uh, which is Upper Scorpius and uh, Ophiuchus here. You, and from all these members, between seven, uh, 70 and 170 have planetary masses. Th those are the ones we call uh, free floating planets and are those identified by red circles in this image. And you can see that they occupy both the region of Upper Scorpius and Ophiuchus. Then we took this um, new membership analysis of this region and obtained the magnitude distribution. Uh, this magnitude distribution has the great advantage that is a direct product of observables. And thanks to the large number of statistics, so the large number of members that we found in this association, uh, this magnitude distribution, you can see it has a great level of precision. And then we can study all kinds of features in this magnitude distribution. I find especially interesting this dip at planetary masses. Then this dip is one of the first times that it has just this been discovered very recently. And I think the fact that we observe it in Upper Scorpius, which is a very young region of less than 10 million years, it, it probably indicates that this dip uh, should somehow be related to the formation or early evolution of these objects. And also, we can start to pose new questions, for instance, whether this dip is related to different formation mechanisms, so, or whether this is indeed the, the real frontier between brown dwarf and planets. So currently, the definition uh, of the boundary between brown dwarf and planets, it's in terms of masses. And any object beyond 13 Jupiter masses is considered as a planet, and anything above is a brown dwarf. But maybe this dip would indicate that in, in terms of formation, the boundary would be uh, at a different position. Then for comparison, here we are seeing the magnitude uh, distribution that Gaia observed in the nearby uh, solar neighborhood in a bubble of 100 parsecs. And you can see that also in this sample, there is a, a dip at these planetary masses similar to the one we observe. The difference is here we are observing stars of all kinds of ages because this is considering all the objects in a hundred uh, parsec bubble, whilst the previous uh, slide I was only showing young, young stars. Then we can also compare the magnitude distribution in, in Upper Scorpius with previous studies, which already uh, showed that free floating planets are very numerous. So here we are seeing uh, a previous study in the same region of Upper Scorpius, also in Sigma Ori, 
and in this uh, open cluster NGC 1333. In all cases, we, we see that free floating planets were number, numerous, but I think the, the great advantage of our new study is that it provides a uh, a way larger um, sample. You can see that we gain uh, an order magnitude in the number of, of members in this region, which helps us to better constrain the, the precision on this magnitude distribution and allows us to statistically um, obtain more, more robust conclusions on, on, on this region. Then we want to convert this magnitude distribution into a mass function. But this transformation is, is not, um, it's not obvious and it's not trivial because we need to rely on evolutionary models. Here you are seeing a color magnitude diagram where I have overplotted the, the models at three and 10 million years. And you can see that only with a seven million year time difference, an object of 0.01 solar masses would go from this position here down here. So it moves quite significantly only with this 7 million year time difference. And this means that if we don't know the age precisely of this region, we automatically will have an uncertainty on the masses inherited for this reason. So taking this uh, limitation in mind, we still computed individual masses for all the stars and we measured the, the mass function. So here, the top panel shows, again, the same magnitude distribution we already commented. And in the lower panel, I am showing you the mass function of this region, um, taking into account the, the, so here, the lower and upper envelope correspond to the lower and uh, upper limit in the ages. In this case, in taking uh, into account an age between three and, and 10 million years. Still, with this uh, age uncertainty, which is inherited in the mass function, this is a relatively precise mass function compared to previous uh, results. And also, it's worth uh, saying that at high masses, the, the slope of this mass function is compatible with uh, Salpeter's slope. Uh, similarly to what has been observed in many other regions. And it is also important to mention that at low mass, we observe a high fraction of, of free floating planets. And we estimated a very low contamination rate using um, synthetic data. So we estimated a low contamination, which has now been proved with spectroscopic observations, uh, as I will comment in a, in a few slides. But this small contamination uh, means that this high fraction is, is true. And it is, in fact, just a lower limit because we are likely missing the most extinct objects in this region. So now we want to use this uh, mass function to compare it with uh, numerical simulations and try to understand if we can constrain somehow the origin of all these uh, free floating planets. So here in red, uh, I show again the same mass function and the two uh, black lines indicate the results of numerical simulations. In one case, uh, the stars are mainly formed, the stars and planets are mainly formed by only core collapse. And the second one has a slightly better resolution and we can resolve these fragmentations into some, some um, circumstellar disks. But in both cases, it is noticeable that we have a large fraction, we observe a large fraction of free floating planets with comparison to these models. And then the question is, uh, what is the origin of all these uh, free floating planets? To try to answer this question, first we compare the fraction that we observe with the predictions of these simulations. And we uh, found that at least, uh, probably at least a 13% of the free floating planets we observed were formed uh, by core collapse. That's to say, similar to, to low mass stars. But here it is clear and evident that there is a large fraction of free floating planets which is not predicted by these, these simulations. And then we, um, we studied the possibility 
that some of these free floating planets were formed in planetary systems like uh, exoplanets and were eventually were ejected from their parent systems due to dynamical instabilities. In short, what we assume is that the fraction of free floating planets that were ejected in, in, by this mechanism has to be proportioned to the number of stars which host giant planets times the number of uh, planetary systems that become unstable times the number of planets per system that are eventually ejected and escape their planetary system. By plugging in some numbers um, which come from exoplanetary surveys and from our knowledge of planetary systems, in this case, uh, we could estimate that uh, planetary, but that this um, formation mechanism is also important, and at least 10% of the free floating planets that we observed formed in planetary systems and um, afterwards left their planetary system. I would like to uh, stop one moment here um, because I think in this case, the take home message of our study is not so much the, the percentage uh, of free floating planets that form by each mechanism. This certainly needs uh, of more studies in order to, uh, to better constrain these numbers. But I think the really important result is that only one of the two mechanisms alone can probably not explain the large population of free floating planets that we found. And in fact, uh, it has to be a combination of at least these two mechanisms and maybe even others to, to explain the, this, this large fraction. And also the, the other question that needs to be solved is whether this fraction of free floating planets that we are observing if in upper Scorpius is universal or maybe in other environments, we will find uh, different fractions. And for this, it is uh, of paramount importance to do and carry similar studies of large uh, regions in the sky where we have a large number statistics to, to see whether this, this fraction is, is universal or not. So now very briefly, I would like to mention that we took some of these uh, faintest objects in our sample and we selected them for spectroscopic follow-up. We, we obtained um, spectra, low, uh, low resolution spectra with EMIR at the GTC and with SWIMS at Subaru. And in fact, uh, the majority of, of targets that we observe have been confirmed to be uh, young free floating planets. Only one of them uh, is not yet clear that, that it is um, a young dwarf, but this, this uh, spectroscopic campaign led to a, a confirmation rate very high and confirms that only around 6% of our samples is uh, contaminated. And this is a contamination rate way below the majority of uh, previous surveys of substellar objects. And we believe that it is because we combine at the same time information of, on proper motions and photometry. And so the, the proper motions add um, a lot of valuable information and help us to reduce a lot the contamination rate. So before um, finishing the talk, I would like to, to spend a, a few minutes uh, commenting also on, on stellar ages. I hope I have uh, motivated the importance of having uh, precise stellar ages in order to have precise masses and in order to also constrain better the, the mass function. There are many, um, there are many methods to determine stellar ages. And, but the difficulty is that different methods can uh, lead up to an discrepancies of the order of 50%. And also different methods are best um, ap applicable at different ages. And eventually it, it is not uh, straightforward how to, how to precisely determine the age of a stellar group. In particular, many methods rely on uh, evolutionary models, but those are especially uncertain at very young ages and for very low mass stars. 
And in this sense, so during my, my master's uh, in Barcelona, I started to work on a, on a method which doesn't rely on evolutionary models, but only takes into account the kinematics of an association to determine its age. Basically, this uh, methodology needs to know precisely the positions and velocities at the present time. And then assuming a galactic potential, one can trace back in time uh, individual orbits of each star and then see when, this, uh, when a group of stars was most concentrated in the past. And at some point one can define the, the time where the size of this association was smallest as the age of the association. This method was uh, used before Gaia, but um, the uncertainties were very high because the samples were quite contaminated and also the precisions in the astrometry and, and spectroscopy were not enough for this method to be successful. However, I think this picture is starting to change now thanks to Gaia because we have samples which are much more precise. Uh, the contamination rates of our sample have uh, significantly reduced. And now we can trace back in time the, with, uh, the orbits with a much better precision. However, Gaia alone is not yet enough. And now what we need is uh, strong efforts on obtaining uh, spectroscopic radial velocities, which, which have similar precisions to the, to the Gaia astrometry. During my PhD, I also had some time to test uh, this method on the Beta Pictoris moving group. For those who are not familiar with Beta Pictoris, this is a young stellar association of around 200 members at only uh, 40 parsecs from the sun. So it is very close and it is uh, very loose also. Uh, it is not like an open cluster. And several disks and planets have been uh, detected around members of Beta Pictoris. And this is why it's also very important to precisely know the age of this uh, young local association. Then we applied this um, traceback uh, methodology to, to this association, and we could determine a dynamical traceback age of 18.5 million years, which is for the first time compatible with isochronal ages. And again, so I think the success of this method was that um, now, thanks to Gaia, we could reduce a lot of the contamination of the group. And also we did a strong uh, spectroscopic campaign to select uh, very precise radial velocities to complement Gaia. And finally, so now I'm working on a similar study in Upper Scorpius, and I'm trying to determine dynamical ages in this area to try to uh, finally obtain more precise mass functions. But in this case, it's a bit more complicated because um, the region of Upper Scorpius and of Ecos has a lot a rich substructure, which we have first to, to analyze, and we have first to um, detect several groups in these uh, 3D positions and 3D velocities space, because uh, our preliminary results already show that each of these groups are likely uh, to have different ages. And this will uh, be very important, uh, as I was saying, to, to understand the star formation history of this region and eventually obtain a more precise mass function. So um, this is uh, all I wanted to present today. I leave you with this uh, final slide summarizing um, what I have been discussing today. So I presented uh, the first large homogeneous sample of free floating planets, which uh, helped us to try to um, understand from the observational point of view, which is their origin. And we proposed that at least core collapse and ejection from planetary systems have to be considered to explain the large fraction of free floating planets that we found in this area. I also showed uh, that a spectroscopic campaign uh, confirmed that the contamination rate is very small in, in our sample. And finally, I'm also working in a methodology to determine precise stellar ages which uh, will hopefully try to help to, to better constrain the mass function and understand the formation on, of these objects.
thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions if you have. Okay, thank you, Nuria, for this very nice uh, talk. So now the session is open for questions. So please uh, raise your hands on, on Zoom so that we can give you floor for your questions. Okay, come on, don't be shy. Okay, Rainer has one. Uh, so, yeah. Yes, I'll okay. approach here. So, um, my question was um, so to, to clarify again so you need core collapse and ejection. You said you need a minimum of 10% for both of those. And that basically includes also embryo ejection, all these other things, right? Because you had like four different mechanisms for, for explaining the free floating planets. So basically, you so, so I, I, there's four mechanisms. Yeah, you mentioned two, but I think like ejection and embryo ejection is more or less the same thing, right? When you say this. So, um, yes, in fact, this is um, so the way maybe I will go to the slide. Yeah, here. So, yes, so here, the, the way I uh, constrain this value is by comparing with numerical simulations. And here, um, it depends on the physics they put in these numerical simulations. In this case, the ones which I used to compare, in one, uh, they only have the resolution enough to see core collapse. And in the second one, they also uh, see this fragmentation. To my knowledge, and I have to say I'm not an expert on these uh, simulations, but to my knowledge, they didn't uh, directly include um, embryo ejection. This is something um, I would need from the um, numerical simulation point of view to, to have in, in order to compare, but uh, sure. So how are these simulations, how much can we trust them? I mean, <laughs> this is not, I, I no, I, this is not like a critical, I don't, I'm, my question is, I know it's, it's the only way of kind of assessing it, but um, mm, do you think they're mature enough? Uh, I mean, for me, it's, not surprising the finding, I think it makes a lot of sense, but still, I mean, these simulations, we all know they're always limited. Yes, yeah, sure. And also I come from the observational point of view, so I would have a tendency to trust more maybe observations to, to simulations just because I know them best. But I think in this, at the stage where we are now, so there's a lot of work to do from all of the sides, I would say. Uh, from numerical simulations, I would, ideally like to have simulations where they include not only as I was mentioning core collapse but other uh, formations like uh, you were mentioning embryo ejection but ideally it would be excellent if they can manage to also include um, planetary if you, they have the resolution enough to have a protoplanetary uh, disk formation so they can not only resolve these fragmentations, but also core collapse. This would help to put all the mechanisms in one single simulation and then compare the final results to our observations. Do you think, this, is there any chance to test, I hope my question, is there any chance to test, for example, ejection observationally to trace back a planet to its origin system? And this is also a great question. Here, the problem is that, so now, for these free floating planets that we obtained, uh, we have their positions and proper motions, but we are still missing the parallaxes and the radial velocity. So I don't think we have, uh, they are, so they are too faint to have these pieces of information. And eventually I think those are quite important for this kind of analysis. So you could maybe try to do this in 2D but I think that the level of uncertainty that you would have is very weak, and I'm not sure how confident you could be on the results. Okay, there is another question by Isabel. Hi, uh, congratulations, Nuria, N nice talk. Um, I have a question. 
Uh, concerning what you've said or the follow-up observations with the James Webb uh, te Space Telescope and, and ALMA, um, do you already have some program uh, focused on or devoted to the, the, such a follow-up? And um, related to that, is there any project uh, for the next uh, Vera Rubin Observatory in which you would be able to detect much fainter objects or even <coughs> VET later on? Um, yeah, so it's great that you asked this because this morning I submitted an ALMA proposal <laughs> for trying to characterize, in fact, this um, free floating planet. So the idea would uh, be uh, to try to see if we can detect disks around these uh, free floating planets. So, so far we have already detected some of them to have an infrared excess. So we believe that some of them um, have in, indeed disks, but with ALMA, we would be able to first confirm the, the presence of the disk and maybe um, by measuring uh, ideally the, the mass distribution, we could compare it to the, the stellar content and the, the stellar type of disks that we find for in, in, the, in, in stars. And this comparison would also be very important to try to to understand the origin of these planets. For instance, if we find similar fractions to the, to the fraction we find for stars, this would indicate that probably these free floating planets formed in a similar way to stars. On the contrary, if we find uh, much smaller fractions or we find disks which have been truncated or very uh, small perturbed disks, maybe this would uh, indicate that a, an important fraction formed by, by ejection from planetary systems and in this ejection, they could somehow be truncated or the disk could have sub suffered from, from this um, from this process. This is uh, maybe regarding ALMA and uh, regarding the, the James Webb. So we don't have any proposal yet, but uh, we will try to submit uh, one for the next call that they will open. And here, I think James Webb can help us a lot to study the atmospheres of these objects. So now with the low resolution spectroscopic campaign that we have, this is in fact very low resolution. It, we only have the continuum and this is just used for, for, for confirmation. So it allows us to confirm that they are uh, young and they have planetary masses, but it, we don't have the resolution for, for knowing the composition of the atmospheres. And here it would be very interesting already to characterize um, the, the abundance of these objects and also to compare it with planets which are part of planetary systems. Because again, this could give us uh, information on, on their origin. If they have similar composition to the exoplanets in planetary systems, that maybe could indicate that uh, the origin is, is con somehow connected. Okay, so, so may, may, may I have uh, another question? Yeah, which sure. Is, which is uh, related just with the uh, two slides later. So, uh, two slides here? Yeah, so that one, when, when, you, when you trace ages dynamically. So, um, it's just a question of ignorance. Is it enough to, to calculate the minimum distance between the objects to be sure that they are really bounded? So, in fact, this whole strategy. Uh, is only valid under the assumption that the stars are not bound because uh -huh. we treat them as um, test particles in a gravitational potential, but we don't take into account the interactions among stars. So this is a, a very important assumption uh, of the method. And I think in the case of, for instance, beta pictoris, this is true because uh, these stars have a very low density so they are um, very already very dispersed and and so so we know that they are not gravitationally bound but this technique would not be uh, so valid in for instance systems which we would know that they are gravitationally bound and where the interactions among stars would be important okay thank you and congratulations thank you Okay, other questions? 
Someone I think we have here one the at the room. Okay. Can I do it, Francisco? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Um, it's related with the spectra that you show. In yes. The, in the objects. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you have any clue about what is the composition of the object that produces that kind of a spectra? I need, I need some units here. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully we will publish this soon and, and otherwise I, I can show you the the full spectra, but this is, as you see it's very low resolution, so here we don't have. Uh, we don't have the individual lines. No, no, I, I'm coming from the planetary system. Okay, the star. so for me, this is really specific kind of uh, spectra, but it's really. Uh, incredible that we can find an object of 10 Jupiter masses with the spectra that I should okay. see. That's why I ask any clue about the composition of that. So as far as I understand, so we cannot determine yet the composition with this. I think we would need a higher resolution spectra for that. I, I'm seeing yeah. this as a planet. Yes. You are seeing this as a star. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm. I, I I think the answer is that with we we don't know yet the composition just with this spectra. I think with this spectra you can somehow infer um, the mass given that we also know the distance because we assume we are assuming it belongs to the, um, the association then we also can know that this is uh, a, a young um, a young planet but because here at this uh, specific uh, wavelength we have this particular triangular shape this helps us to uh, know that this is a young dwarf more all their objects have a more flatter part and Another uh, thing that we use to confirm their youth is by comparing with library spectra in other regions of young and more evolved field stars. So this is the the, the type of hints that we have to uh, to know the, the the properties. But again, the composition, I think only with this data, it, we, you can not infer it. I think we would need higher resolution, and for that, this probably we need the James Webb. So I'm, I'm sorry, but I think I cannot maybe, know maybe, more. But, but you see absorption bands, so there's probably water absorption or methane, no? Well, what about <laughs> we, we make this application with refrigerant or something? Yeah. 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 Yeah.